Hi, I'm Jacob Fountain, and today I'll be presenting on uh, the first part of chapter 26. So, this first part uh, is about China in this kind of period that we're talking about early modern times, and it can be really defined for China as a time of political change and kind of search for political stability. So, as you can see, China kind of goes through three major dynasties through this period that we're talking about, the Yuan, Ming, and the uh, Qing dynasties. So first, I'll talk about the Yuan dynasty. So uh, it ruled from 1279 to 1368. Uh, this is the Mongol-led uh, dynasty of China. The Mongols, as you probably know, swept through most of Eurasia and then the empire broke up. So the Yuan dynasty is the broken up China ruled by the Mongols. So the Mongols really tried to uh, keep Han Chinese from uh, gaining much power in the government. So they uh, ignored Confucian Chinese laws and other kind of practices that would have uh, had them become more popular and influential in government. And they also brought in, of course, Mongol leaders to be the imperial family and uh, higher up military and government officials, but also they brought in Turkish and Persian bureaucrats instead of the Chinese, again, to limit their power in government. So, as you can kind of imagine, the Chinese weren't very happy about this, and in 1368, they uh, overthrew the Mongol leaders, and this created the Ming government, <coughs> the Ming dynasty. So, the Ming ruled from 1368 to 1644. So, um, in the text, uh, it kind of talks about these two great emperors that kind of define what the Ming uh, were. So, first you had Emperor Hongwu, who ruled from 1368 to 1398. So he was the first Ming emperor. So, uh, his kind of rule is governed by this uh, bringing back of Confucian ideas, uh, traditional Chinese values and laws that the Mongols got rid of, and creating this centralized state that you saw in previous dynasties. Uh, also, during Hong Wu's reign, he brought back the use of eunuchs, which were these castrated men in the imperial palace that uh, kind of ran the imperial uh, the imperial palace and saw to the imperial family. Then you have Emperor Yang Le, who ruled from 1403 to 1424. Uh, his reign is best characterized by these vast naval expeditions. So they. Uh, Young Le funded and supported these big kind of fleets that would go out and uh, make contact and trade with other people, most notably India, uh, Southeast Asia, and even as far as uh, Malindi in uh, Southeast Africa. Uh, he also moved the capital to Beijing. It was in Nanjing, moved it up north to Beijing, uh, mostly to deal with Mongol threat, to have that kind of pressure of the capital right there in the north. So then kind of move into the Great Wall. Again, with that Mongol threat, they uh, wanted to reinforce the Great Wall, which had been started in the 4th century uh, BCE. So uh, the Ming emperors kind of rebuilt it, uh, extended it to about 1,550 miles, and also kind of reinforced it with watchtowers, signal towers, and uh, better barracks for more soldiers to be uh, stationed there. So, uh, that was kind of the peak of the Ming. Now I'll kind of get into the decline and eventual fall of the Ming Dynasty. So, in about 1520 to 1560, the Ming saw very heavy uh, pirate activity along the eastern coast. And this is very important because it was uh, a lot of economic activity happened on the eastern coast. You know, a lot of trade from the north from the north to the south or vice versa. A lot of ships kind of patrol this area, so it's very important. And so them not being able to deal with these pirates kind of highlighted the ineptitude of the government and the military. They couldn't deal with these seemingly simple issue. So uh, another issue that kind of popped up around this time is the Ming emperors become a lot more decadent and attack detached from society. So. A great example in the text is Emperor Wang Li, who ruled from uh, 1572 to 1620. 
and pretty much is said to have never really interacted with government officials. He just kind of stayed in the imperial palace, the Forbidden City, and just had the government run totally uh, dependent from him. Very kind of bad light for an emperor to do so. Uh, in the early 1600s, famine became very uh, prominent all across China. Uh, with the government and military inept, can't really do anything. These famines grew, people were starving, and eventually led to peasant revolts that happened in about 1630s. Also at this time, Manchus in the Northeast, I'll kind of get into those a little bit later, um, allied with these rebels, but when the rebels took Beijing, the Manchus betrayed them, uh, and took over kind of most of the Ming Dynasty controlled areas. Uh, people believed that the Manchus would kind of restore the Ming, but they just kind of said, no, we're taking over, this is our land now. So that brings to the Qing Dynasty ruled from 1644 to 1911. This was the last imperial dynasty of China. Uh, so a little bit about who the Manchus were. Uh, Manchus are very similar to Mongols. They're similar linguistically, uh, kind of traditionally. They have the same kind of traditions of um, nomadism, archery, horseback, that kind of thing. They had a similar religion aspects and uh, agricultural uh, base that the Mongols had. So they come from the land northeast of China and kind of what's known as Manchuria, of course, but also uh, kind of southeast Russia, Mongolia, uh, Siberia-esque. So not a very uh, hospitable land. So this, uh, the text also goes into a, some great emperors during the Qing period. Uh, first is Emperor Kangxi, who ruled from 1661 to 1722. Uh, he's known as this great enlightened ruler. He often brought, was a big fan of bringing European sciences and texts to China to learn from them. He also brought Jesuit missionaries that were, uh, as we kind of learned, are very well in, educated in these kind of aspects. And Kangxi was very interested in all these new sciences, especially uh, uh, ones with weaponry. Uh, so Kangxi was not only this enlightened ruler, he's also very practical. He funded and supported these flood control and irrigation projects all across China, but especially the Yellow River, uh, very known to meander and to flood uh, over time, causing issue to the agricultural fields uh, that utilize the Yellow River. So these were very important for the time. And then also, uh, Kangxi was also had good military prowess. He oversaw the conquering of Taiwan, which had been this kind of stronghold for rebel Ming generals that kind of hold, hold out till uh, the Qing came in and uh, removed them. Then we get to his grandson, Emperor Qianlong, who ruled from 1736 to 1795. Uh, during his reign is kind of seen as the peak of uh, Qing rule, it's, uh, very kind of economic, cultural, prosperous times. Everything after Qianlong is kind of uh, seen as the downfall of the Qing. But that's neither here nor there. So he's also kind of seen as a great conqueror. He conquered Xinjiang, which is kind of uh, northwest China today, part of the Takamakan Desert, that kind of large area, but mostly arid uh, environment. He also oversaw the conquering, well, not conquering, but campaigns into Vietnam, Burma, and Nepal vassal states and creating vassal states so they kind of swore allegiance to the Qing and gave tribute to them. So the book goes into these two kind of big aspects of uh, Chinese tradition and uh, to kind of get a good glimpse of their government. So the first is Son of Heaven. So in Chinese tradition the emperor is given a divine right to rule, sort of like we saw in absolutism in Europe. So the emperor himself is uh, chosen by the heavens to rule over China. So this gives them, as the book calls them, awesome authority. So he has this huge amount of power and influence over the people. This also gives him this great luxurious life. He lives in this palace and he has so much wealth and 
uh, concubines and everything he could pretty much want. Uh, but it also gives him a great deal of respect. You couldn't utter the uh, emperor's true name, uh, that was strictly taboo, or he also had to perform a kowtow when meeting with the emperor, which is you had to bow and hit your head on the floor as a sign of submissive submissiveness to his authority. The next big thing is the scholar bureaucrats. These people are the people that run the daily government. The imperial family does so much, these guys really run the day-to-day -day things all over the country. So, <clears throat> as you can kind of assume, they're very well educated, come from wealthy families, and they pass these civil service, uh, ser civil service exams, which I will get into uh, next. But yeah, these People are very well educated in Confucian, uh, the Analects of Confucius and other works, very uh, well educated, literate, and also come from these wealthy families. So finally I'll kind of discuss the civil service exams themselves. So as I mentioned, they were based off these Confucian classics, works by Confucius himself or disciples and followers that come after. So. Uh, these exams were taken on three levels, the uh, district, provincial, and metropolitan, or the national level. Uh, and each kind of came with their own levels of prestige. So district, uh, the district exams, you could probably get uh, maybe local government, a teacher, or maybe a magistrate. While provincial, you get higher jobs and uh, maybe the province, of course, or the capital. And then metropolitan is the best of the best. Uh, however, these exams were very difficult. Uh, even the di district was very tough. Millions of people took these almost uh, every time they were offered, but uh, hardly any really passed. Uh, the book goes into good detail about them, and I'll kind of describe them here. Uh, the cells, well, rooms, they're pretty much cells that the people took these exam in. You pretty much just had a bench with a table, a uh, bed, food was given to you a few times a day, and you had a chamber pot. So it was pretty grueling uh, test taking. Uh, you had days, you had to write for days just writing about these Confucius works and how they were to be analyzed and everything. It was not a easy task, as you can probably assume. So, but with these exams, the reason so many people took them was because with them came great wealth, prestige, respect with the government jobs. Uh, kind of an important thing about them is that any male could take them. No woman, women couldn't take these, but any male, regardless of class, could take these. However, uh, it's usually just the wealthy that were able to afford the education, the books, and uh, other kind of... Uh, teachings to go along with uh, learning the Confucian uh, classics and work. So the lower classes could take uh, these exams, but it was very unlikely that they could. But it, it, there is still that possibility. So that's pretty much it for this presentation. Thanks for watching, guys.